Well, greetings, church family. Today's daily Bible reading had us in 2 Chronicles chapters 30 and 31. Now, in chapter 30, verses 1 through 12, we see a wonderful high point during this age of the divided kingdoms of Israel and Judah, which really, let's face it, have been mostly low points. Here's a great high point. Hezekiah, the king of Judah, seeks to not unify Israel and Judah politically or militarily, but rather the king of Judah sought unity through returning to the right way worship of God prescribed by his word. It centered this around the Passover celebration, which Hezekiah rightly recognized it had not been kept by God's people in direct violation of the word of the Lord, specifically the law of Moses, the Torah. Now in verses 7 through 9, we see that the message sent by Hezekiah makes reference to God's promises in Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28. Of course, those are blessings for obedience, curses for disobedience. And in verse 9, notice how he appeals to the ten northern tribes that comprise the kingdom of Israel by pointing to God's character, referencing God's self-revelation in Exodus 34, 6, where you read, that then the Yahweh passed by in front of him, that's Moses, and proclaimed Yahweh, Yahweh God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth. And of course, it's that graciousness and compassion of God that Hezekiah references. Messengers are sent as far as Zebulun, which itself was not the furthest northern tribe, but it did border Asher and Naphtali, and those were the northernmost tribes. Sadly, most of Israel laughs, scorns, mocks Hezekiah's messengers. They show how far they had fallen and that they would not be willing to celebrate the remembrance of the Lord's freeing of their ancestors from Egypt. But thankfully, some from Asher, Manasseh, and Zebulun did join in the Passover celebration in Jerusalem. And notice that it took humility for this to occur. And notice also the wonderful unity in worship that God blessed Judah with at this time. The rest of chapter 30, verses 13 through 27, is that Passover celebration under Hezekiah's leadership. And it was marked by obedience to God's word and all of the specifics, the timing, the sacrifices, and so on. It's marked by humility, including shame over sin, exaltation of the Lord, thanksgiving to the Lord, and great joy. The text says greater than any since Solomon, who was hundreds of years earlier. Well, we get to chapter 31, verses 1 through 10, and we see that Amazingly, blessedly, that celebration of Passover was not the end of fidelity to God for this generation of Judeans under Hezekiah. Every single person who was at that festival, including those that had come from the northern tribes, they put their repentant faith in God into action, and they destroyed idols all across Judah and Benjamin, Ephraim, and Manasseh. And there's a continued reformation we see under Hezekiah in Judah, and it includes the reappointment of faithful priests and provision of more than enough sustenance for the priests and, and a vocal blessing to the Lord as well. He also set aside his own royal goods for offerings and festivals, and there's mass tithing by the people. They're all getting back to the law of Moses here. Wonderful to see, going back to what God's word had prescribed to them under that Sinaitic covenant, that Mosaic covenant. And then finally, the rest of chapter 31, verses 11 through 21, we see that the excess giving was not wasted, but rather stored to help continue to provide for the temple and priests for the sake of worship there. Verse 20, we see that Hezekiah's legacy is certainly one that you and I ought to want to follow. Well, the big principle that we see from these two chapters, in addition to just this just wonderful joy of seeing the, the celebration of the Lord, of his character and his actions, and how God blessed the people because of this, we see this, unity. Unity is important to the Lord. In fact, he hates division in his people. But we need to understand that unity for the mere sake of unity is not the unity valued by God. The unity sought after by the Lord is based on the unity that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have. John 17, 19 through 21 says, For their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also, this is Jesus speaking, that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word. So his disciples at the time and those in the future, such as us today, if indeed you are in Christ, if God has graciously saved you through faith in Jesus Christ alone as your Lord and Savior, as you recognize your sin and repent of of it, trusting in Christ alone. So he says that they all, 
that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. So unity has to be true unity that is valued by the Lord and that God wants for us is based on the unity of the Trinity. True unity with the Lord means you and I are going to reject any calls for unity that are not centered around the one true God who revealed himself in the Bible. See, the Israelites were unified in their wickedness. That's not the unity the Lord is after. And if Judah had just unified themselves with Israel for the sake of just, let's call ourselves God's people, but there's not a unity in the actual worship of the Lord, a unity in trusting in him in obeying God, that is not the unity the Lord is after. Listen to Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, this is Paul speaking, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. This is written to Christians. Christians are to show tolerance for one another in love. Love, right? Not easily offended by things. Being gracious towards one another. Of course, if we see one another in sin, we're commanded to lovingly call out that sin. But diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all to be unified with just whomever. And it's not based on the one true God who revealed himself in the scriptures. We have to reject that kind of unity. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 18, Paul says, Do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will welcome you and I will be a father to you and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Like Hezekiah, may you and I also do what is good, right, and true before Yahweh our God out of a genuine love for him and his word, and may it be a wholehearted faithfulness to the one true God above. Let us love unbelievers as Hezekiah did, loving the those in Israel that had turned their backs on the Lord enough to send messengers to call them to repentance. We should certainly do that. But we do not unify ourselves with the world just out of a sake of this kind of shallow, fake unity. Our unity has to be in the Lord, centered on what his word has to say. Well, this has been Second Chronicles chapters 30 and 31, and I hope you have a great day.